Hi, listeners. Just a quick reminder that starting in August, Cults is moving exclusively to Spotify. Being a part of the Spotify family means that we're able to bring you more in-depth and exciting content than ever before. And we can't wait for you to check it out. Mystery, manipulation, murder. Don't miss any of it. All you have to do is download the Spotify app for free and search Cults. Give it a follow and start enjoying. That's it. We can't thank you enough for listening to Cults, and we look forward to seeing you exclusively on Spotify in August. Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of sexual situations that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. When Jeff and Christiana Bent first devoted themselves to Our Lord Righteousness Church, they believed that the leader of the church was the embodiment of God. His will was God's will, and they were his humble servants. So years later, when the leader told Christiana that God wanted them to be intimate, she was happy to consent. When she told her husband about the affair, she had no remorse. It had been a direct order from God. But Jeff was heartbroken. He understood why Christiana had spent the night with the leader. She was, after all, his disciple. But he could never look at the leader the same. It wasn't so much that God had chosen his wife, but that the leader was Jeff's own father. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults, a ParCast original. Every Tuesday, we take a look at a cult's practices, their leader, and their followers. Today, we're taking a deep dive into Wayne Bent and his breakaway Adventist cult, the Lord Our Righteousness Church, which predicted the world would end on Halloween 2007. At ParCast, we're grateful for you, our listeners. You allow us to do what we love— let us know how we're doing. Reach out on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. And if you enjoy today's episode, the best way to help us is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It really does help. We also now have merchandise. Head to Parcast.com slash merch for more information. You can listen to previous episodes of Cults as well as all of Parcast's other shows on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. A new episode comes out every Tuesday. The Lord Our Righteousness Church, also known as Strong City, made headlines in the early 2000s for their apocalyptic beliefs. But in 2008, they found themselves making headlines again when leader Wayne Bent was outed as a sexual predator. At its height in 1987, the Lord Our Righteousness Church had around 300 followers, though membership declined over the years as the cult's ideology grew more radical. But even from the beginning, the followers of Strong City believed that Wayne Bent was God made flesh. This week, we'll follow how Wayne Bent formed his own religious sect after a split with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Next week, we'll look at how Wayne Bent found himself on the defense as the entire nation watched his downfall. Wayne Curtis Bent was born in Riverside, California on May 18, 1941. The details on his life before the Lord Our Righteousness Church are sparse, but small glimpses provide the portrait of a man who was shaken by sudden tragedy. When Wayne was three years old, he was on a car trip with his mother and older sister. As they were passing through the small town of Dottle, New Mexico, they were struck by another car. Wayne and his sister were unharmed, but their mother, Elizabeth, was killed instantly. The traumatizing incident stayed with Wayne for the rest of his life. Vanessa is going to take over on the psychology here. A quick reminder, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. Thanks, Greg. According to a study conducted by Beverly Lynn Hu with the Danish Cancer Society Research Center, children who suffered the sudden loss of a parent can face severe attachment and relationship issues as they grew older. It's reasonable to think Wayne did not receive the proper emotional tools needed to heal from his mother's death. 
And to complicate matters, his father remarried just a year later in 1945. Then, over the next nine years, he fathered four children with his new wife. It's not hard to imagine that Wayne felt like both he and his mother had been replaced by this new family. Life only grew more difficult as he became a teenager. In 1955, when he was 14, Wayne claims he was kidnapped and sexually assaulted by a stranger. Dr. Suzanne Babel has written several books on the lasting effects of sexual trauma in children. According to her, the effects of sexual abuse can last long into adulthood. These range from post-traumatic stress disorder to poor self-esteem to an unhealthy, hyperactive sex drive. Combined with his already developing attachment issues, it's no wonder that Wayne spent his entire adult life cultivating a world in which people could not leave him. In 1959, when Wayne was 18, he joined the U.S. Navy Reserves, perhaps in an effort to find some structure and stability. He was stationed around California, where he served for two years before being honorably discharged. A year later, in 1962, Wayne married a woman named Joan Beckley. They settled into the rural town of Poway, California, about 30 minutes north of San Diego. Here, Wayne and Joan raised a son named Jeff and two daughters, Susan and Christy. At least in the beginning, Wayne took to family life rather well. His wife and children provided the stable home that had been missing throughout his upbringing. And like many people who crave structure and community, Wayne also took an interest in religion, specifically the Baptist Church. He began attending services in 1967, when he was 25, and was baptized later that same year. He even started teaching Sunday school. Soon after involving himself with the church, Wayne felt himself growing so close to God that at one point he literally heard God's voice speak to him. God told him to leave the Baptist church and to no longer worship him on Sundays. Wayne listened to the voice and soon joined the Seventh-day Adventist church. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was founded in the 19th century by the Millerite movement. The Millerites preached that the second coming of Christ would occur, as it is written in the book of Daniel, which says, quote, Unto 2300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. They interpreted the passage as a countdown to October 22, 1844. When the second coming did not occur, the date became known as the Great Disappointment. However, several movements within the Millerite religion believed the basis for the prediction was true, even if the actual date was wrong. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is one such sect. They believe that the second coming of Jesus Christ is near, but don't predict an exact date. Their name comes from their preferred day of worship, Saturday, the seventh day of the week. This was likely the reason Wayne gravitated towards them after leaving the Baptist Church, in order to fulfill God's words to him. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is a fundamentalist sect of Christianity that has been accused of being a cult in and of itself because of the strict rules of conduct congregants are expected to adhere to. Founding member Ellen White wrote that every other church besides the Seventh Adventists were teaching lies from the devil. Several cults have developed as offshoots of the church, including the Branch Davidians of Waco, Texas, and their infamous leader, David Koresh. Something about the nature of the church spoke to Wayne Bent, and he and his family quickly became enthusiastic congregants. Wayne even became a member of the clergy in his newfound faith. In 1974, 33-year-old Wayne and his family were transferred to a church in his hometown of Riverside, California, and he was made an associate pastor. His duties included assisting the senior pastor in services and conducting ministry to his congregates. As part of his ministry training, the church sent him to a conference on Erhard Seminar Training, also known as EST. EST gained global recognition in the 1970s as an empowerment course. The idea was that the participants spent two long, grueling weekends talking about their pasts and habitual patterns while trainers berated them for previous failures. The hope was that by reliving their painful pasts, participants could free themselves of them. The participants were then rebuilt into an image they saw for themselves. Some participants found the program liberating and enlightening. 
critics of EST have called it one of the most effective forms of brainwashing ever developed. Wayne was fascinated by this methodology. He committed himself to incorporating EST into his ministry with the church. He also began spending every waking moment at the church, working with his congregates. But his devotion to the ministry seemingly took a toll on his marriage. For reasons unknown, his wife Joan filed for divorce in 1981. Wayne has since said that she was never as devoted to God as he was, which likely led to the split. However, it also stands to reason that as Joan was not particularly religious before Wayne was baptized, being drawn into a fundamentalist religion like the Seventh-day Adventist Church might have been more than she signed up for. As she saw her husband growing more extreme in his beliefs, she may have worried that he was no longer the man she married and left. Conversely, Wayne could have encouraged the split. Psychotherapist Perpetua Neo explained that people with attachment issues tend to push away those that they love out of a fear of vulnerability. This characteristic is true in many cult leaders. They need to be seen as infallible by their followers because, in actuality, they crumble under the slightest scrutiny or criticism. It doesn't appear that Wayne had contact with his wife or children after the divorce. Without his family, Wayne threw himself completely into his ministry. Wayne was promoted to head pastor, a position he served until 1982. He developed a series of seminars he called Life Supports, which consisted of intense 15-hour sessions wherein Wayne put participants through the same kind of abuse and humiliation utilized by EST training. Wayne began incorporating scripture into his sessions, which gave the manipulative program a decidedly divine credential. In fact, his program became so popular that he was invited to travel to Adventist churches across North America teaching life supports. Former cult member Johnny D. Miller described the program in his book, The Follower, An Account of Cult Addiction. For example, if Wayne was training a new minister, he would shame them into admitting every sin they had committed in their lives. He would grill them about scripture and tear apart their interpretations if they got the tiniest detail wrong. In doing so, Wayne was able to strip the participant down to their most vulnerable state. He would feed on their self-doubt, assuring them that only he could help them redeem themselves in the eyes of God. Then, he would welcome them back into the church and into God's good graces. In rebuilding them, Wayne would develop deep emotional control over the participant. He primed himself as their savior, the only one who truly understood their misdeeds and their path to redemption. And slowly, Wayne found that he was able to preach his own interpretation of the Bible without pushback. He claimed to be teaching a simplified, more literal reading of Scripture. In reality, he was developing his own religious doctrine. Wayne based much of his teachings on Ellen White, a founding member and prophetess of the Seventh Adventist Church, who wrote, quote, The Bible and the Bible alone is our rule of faith. In the mid-1800s, Ellen White reported receiving visions directly from God, just as Wayne would later attest. He likely found inspiration in White's life when constructing the narrative of his own past. Wayne was clearly using her life as inspiration for the narrative he was constructing about his own life. In hindsight, he was setting himself up to be a divine leader within the church. But the leaders of the Adventist church took action before he could accomplish that goal. They felt that his life support seminars were teaching his pupils to align their loyalties with Wayne instead of the actual church. The conflict grew heated, and eventually Wayne confronted the church leaders, accusing them of incorrectly interpreting scriptures. In 1987, 46-year-old Wayne Bent officially split from the Seventh-day Adventists, declaring the church, quote, one of the daughters of the great harlot, end quote. He reached out to his many pupils and told them he was beginning a new church based on his interpretation of the Bible, and only his church could save them from eternal damnation. His followers were quick to follow. Thus, the Lord Our Righteousness Church was born. Coming up, Wayne finds himself the leader of a movement. 
Every so often, something so impactful happens, it has the power to capture the attention of a whole country. An event so deadly or dumbfounding, it has no choice but to live on in infamy. Hi, Parcasters. It's Ashley Flowers, and I'm exposing the most sinister cases from the darkest corners of the globe in my new True Crime Limited series, International Infamy. Every Tuesday, come along as I guide you on a wicked world tour. 15 different countries, 15 infamous crimes. Take a trip to Iceland where six people confessed to a murder that never actually happened. Journey to Mexico where a Lucha Libre wrestler moonlights as a serial killer. And travel to New Zealand where two friends hatch a deadly plan to become famous. Each episode of International Infamy explores the twists and turns of a notoriously high-profile case, zeroing in on the cultural details which make the crime unique to its location, and explaining why it couldn't have happened anywhere else. Follow my new Spotify original from ParCast, International Infamy with Ashley Flowers, and catch a new episode every week. Listen free on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to the story. In 1987, 46-year-old Wayne Bent split from the Seventh-day Adventist Church and began his own sect, the Lord Our Righteousness Church. The name came from a passage in the Bible, Jeremiah 33:16, which reads, quote, And this is the name wherewith she shall be called, the Lord Our Righteousness. Wayne's new church initially boasted 300 members, all former Adventists who had left to follow Wayne. Most of these followers had been indoctrinated during the life support seminars and truly believed that Wayne would lead them to Christ. No one more fervently than Wayne's 24-year-old son, Jeff. There's no indication that either of Wayne's daughters followed him in his religious teachings. Like their mother, they probably didn't share Wayne's religious convictions. After beginning the church, Wayne seemingly severed ties with the three women he used to call family. Instead, he worked on cultivating a new family. In 1988, he led a 10-day retreat for his 300 followers at Hat Creek Campground in Redding, California. One of Wayne's most loyal followers, David Mead, owned property there that Wayne was able to use. The first Sunday of the retreat, he gathered his followers and told them that they were to meet early the following morning. He warned that anyone who missed the sunrise meeting would literally die. The next morning, he was pleased to see that all 300 members were accounted for. As the meeting commenced, a massive thunderstorm moved into the area. Thunder and lightning made for a spectacular backdrop as Wayne began preaching. Thunderstorms are common in Northern California, but Wayne's followers believed that God was sending a sign. To them, Wayne literally brought God's own thunder. Ironically, some Christian teachings claim that the lightning bolt is a symbol of the devil rather than God. In hindsight, that symbolism was equally telling. After the thunderstorm subsided, Wayne held a mass baptism in Hat Creek. One by one, each of his 300 members entered the creek, and Wayne personally baptized them. The fact that the thunderstorm died down during the baptism only solidified the followers' belief that God was on their side. During the retreat, Wayne also introduced the idea of sinlessness. Many Christian teachings say that mankind is born into sin and they must follow a certain moral code, such as the Ten Commandments, to rid themselves of sin. That's not how Wayne operated. Wayne had already used the est techniques to tear these followers down. He had convinced them that they were sinful, worthless creatures, not worthy of God's love. Then he had rebuilt them in his image. Now he told them they were sinless. They had no reason to fear God's wrath because Wayne had already delivered them. Wayne was shortening the distance between himself and God. Cult expert Rick Ross has written about the dangers of a cult leader appearing to have divine powers or direct communication with God. The cult leader and God become so intertwined, the followers can no longer tell the difference. They begin to obey the cult leader as though they're obeying God. Wayne used the concept of sinlessness to erase shame and guilt in his followers. 
In the short term, this freed his followers in a way that would have been refreshingly liberating in comparison to the Adventist church. But in the long term, it laid the groundwork for Wayne to take advantage of his followers. A 2018 study published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology found that people who are more prone to feeling guilt tend to behave in an interpersonally sensitive way and act more socially responsible. By removing the concept of guilt, Wayne had removed social responsibility and opened his church up to questionable practices. Eventually, this sinlessness would leave many of his youngest followers susceptible to inappropriate relationships with Wayne, who began grooming them when they were as young as 12. And Wayne was quick to establish nudity as an acceptable form of guilt-free worship. In an October 1988 meeting, Wayne selected several members to come before the congregation and disrobe. When they had gotten down to their underwear, Wayne stopped them. He lauded them for their loyalty and shamelessness and let them sit down. A few of the selected members had refused to comply with Wayne's request to strip in public. They were expelled from the church. In fact, Wayne never hesitated to expel a member for insubordination. He demanded uncompromising loyalty and would banish members for the smallest infractions. Within a year, by 1989, Wayne had lost about a third of his members, mostly through expulsion. Some of these ex-followers would later recall that at some point throughout 1988, Wayne stopped quoting the Bible exactly and seemed to focus too heavily on his own ideas. Many members saw where the church was heading and left of their own accord. In fact, Wayne would often tell his members to disregard biblical quotes and passages. It seemed a quick about-face, considering the fact that Wayne had left the Adventist church just two years prior because their reading of the scripture was not literal enough. Then, in 1990, Wayne was challenged by someone who was once fiercely loyal to his cause, David Mead, the owner of the land they were using in Reading. Mead had risen through the ranks quickly within the cult and soon began to voice concerns over the way Wayne was running his church. The two finally came to a head, and Wayne decided to leave California entirely. After the split with David, Wayne's church had dwindled to only 70 members, but they would have been the ones most devoted to him. He moved them to a 320-acre ranch he owned near the town of Sandpoint, Idaho. Sandpoint is a lakeshore town approximately 90 minutes northeast of Spokane, Washington. It had a population of just over 5,000. The church settled in as a true commune, with the 70 members pooling their earnings to support the church financially. Many of them worked as handymen, plumbers, and carpenters around Sandpoint. During the 1990s, Wayne and his church were happy to worship quietly in the remote rural community. The women dressed in long, modest dresses, and everyone was vegetarian. But Wayne wanted his little commune to grow, which proved challenging in a remote, traditional town like Sandpoint. Then, in 1996, Wayne and his son Jeff had an idea. They would advertise the church online. They started a website called World Internet Distributary Source, or WINDS. In addition to their biblical teachings, they also posted conspiracy theories on the New World Order. Wayne also published several books preaching his brand of the gospel, hoping they would send new followers running. But neither of these endeavors garnered much attention. His was just one in a vast sea of conspiracy theory websites, Wayne soon realized that if he was going to compete, he needed to rise above the noise. He needed to make himself the most divine being on earth. Wayne began developing a plan. First, he needed to move the cult to a location far more remote than Sandpoint, Idaho. Convincing his 70 followers to relocate proved far easier than he had expected. Not only did they hang on his every word, but by 2000, the Lord Our Righteousness were facing harassment and vandalism from the surrounding community in the wake of the Heaven's Gate mass suicide. Wayne's neighbors grew concerned about the strange cult-like commune down the road. They started pestering followers on a weekly basis vandalizing fences and yelling insults at them as they drove by the property. 
Wayne worried that the vandalism would escalate to violence and suggested that his church relocate in early 2000. Wayne and his followers began packing their bags for greener pastures. When the local sheriff noticed they were cleaning up shop, he stopped by to check on them. He asked Wayne point blank if he was taking his followers to a remote location to commit mass suicide, like the Heaven's Gate cult. But Wayne gave every assurance that they were just continuing their worship somewhere down south, at a location that God would reveal to him. After driving for a few days, they stumbled across a ranch in the remote desert town of Traveser Creek, New Mexico. Population, 160. They named their compound Strong City, a phrase used throughout the Bible. It meant a safe place. That day, Wayne wrote on his website, quote, This strong city will keep out the corruption of the nations and the world. Life in Strong City was strenuous, but simple. At first, everyone lived in RVs they had driven down from Idaho. But soon, the community worked together to build homes, install plumbing, and plant gardens. The children were never enrolled in school. Instead, Wayne would be their teacher. The commune shared their resources, always saving the best of everything for Wayne, who was far too busy writing his website to pitch in. Then, in June of 2000, Wayne was relaxing in his living room when the voice of God spoke to him and delivered his higher calling. The voice said, You are Messiah. Then the spirit of Michael the Archangel entered Wayne and made him divine. From that moment on, Wayne said he was, quote, humanity and divinity combined. But Wayne's prophecy didn't end there. Michael the Archangel also told him that the world was ending on Halloween 2007. By October 31st, 2007, all of his followers must find a death to self in order to be saved. Wayne immediately understood his task, to ready the souls of his followers for the coming apocalypse, or they would be eternally damned. He was determined not to let them down. He took a new name, Michael Trevesser. Michael for the archangel whose divinity now worked through him, and Trevesser for the land in New Mexico they were settled on. The naming convention was typical during biblical times, and Michael probably thought it lent some credence to his newfound Messiah status. Then, in the days following the announcement, two of the married women on the compound, Kathy Bowman and Debbie Kyle, showed up at Michael's trailer and told him that God asked them to begin a sexual relationship with him, a relationship they would later call being consummate. They would not leave their marriages, but they would become his wives, both spiritually and physically. Michael said that God spoke to him in that moment and told him that this was, in fact, his will. And so these two married women became Michael's witnesses, a word that feels eerily close to mistresses and for good reason. Of course, their husbands were heartbroken to discover the new arrangement. But Michael told them that there was nothing to be done, that God had forced this on them for reasons that would be explained after the end of the world. And so, Michael became their emotional support. In a tear-filled interview, Debbie's husband recalled that while he did not understand why God had done this, he was thankful to Michael for helping him work through it. Of course, while all this could have been the work of divine intervention, it seems more likely the result of careful brainwashing. You'll recall that Michael had set up the WINS website to attract new members to the cult and that it had gone unnoticed by the world at large. But the members of his cult were avid readers of the site and his daily blog-style posts. Just before Michael was declared Messiah, he posted pieces of scripture to his website about laying with God, espousing God, and giving yourself wholly to God. Then he added his own interpretations of the scripture that seemingly justified extramarital sex with God's conduit. Once he became that conduit, theoretically, his bed would never be empty. So while Michael never approached any woman on his compound for sex, he found a bulletproof way of suggesting his intentions. By the time the women had interpreted what he wanted, it felt like their own ideas, like a hypnotist, 
Michael had found the power of suggestion to be his own secret weapon. Whether he knew it or not, Michael was following a long tradition of cult leaders who used divinity as an excuse to sleep with their female followers. Cult expert Dr. Yanya Lalich has written about this at length, noting, quote, Sexual control is seen as the final step in objectification of the cult member by the authoritarian leader who is able to satisfy his needs through psychological manipulation leading to sexual exploitation. Years later, in an interview, Jeff was asked about the day his father became Messiah. The jovial smile faded from his face, and his eyes went hollow. For a moment, he looked exhausted. Then his mouth ticked up into a smile, and he said, quote, God doesn't pick good people. He picks who is willing. The interviewer then asked whether Jeff believed himself to be a good person. Jeff paused, then he quietly whispered, quote, No, I am a very evil person. Coming up, the Son of God delivers his followers. Now back to the story. After settling Strong City in Treveser Creek, New Mexico, in early 2000, 59-year-old Wayne Bent was quick to declare himself the Messiah and renamed himself Michael Treveser. Soon, he took on two wives, both of whom were already married. He assured his followers that God wanted these unions. But as much as extramarital affairs may have been God's plan, they drove many of Michael's followers away. One of Michael's two new wives, or witnesses, was a woman named Kathy Bowman. Her husband, Tim, challenged Michael and called him a fraud. Michael ordered him off the compound by the end of the day. Tim was heartbroken to discover that Kathy would not be coming with him. Instead, she chose to stay on the compound with Michael as his spouse. Another follower, 14-year-old Seth Kyle, was equally horrified by the new arrangement. When his mother, Debbie, explained the concept of a consummate relationship, Seth was appalled. His parents had been married for over 30 years. He couldn't understand how his mother could essentially remarry Michael without divorcing his father. But Michael claimed that God had ordered him and the witnesses down this path. Anyone who had a problem with the arrangement needed to take it up with God. Of course, to his followers, Michael was God, so there was little to be done. Despite his heartbreak, Seth's father remained a devoted follower of Michael for years. But Seth couldn't stand by and watch his parents' marriage fall apart. He woke up early one morning and wrote his mother a letter, begging forgiveness for what he was about to do. Then he fled Strong City. By the time Debbie found the letter from her son, he had already run away to live with relatives in Florida. Neither of Seth's parents went after him. Instead, they hoped that, like the prodigal son, Seth would return to the compound. Thankfully, Seth knew better. He had not scorned a loving family. He had escaped the devil's lair. These types of splits began happening more often as Wayne took more women into his bed. But to those who remained in Strong City, Michael further cemented his Messiah status on September 10, 2001. He once again did this by communicating through his blog. He composed a post on the cult's homepage. It read, quote, You have gone far enough, and now I will show you who it is that rules in the heavens. You have built your Babylonish tower, but I will make the top to break off, and its foundations to sink into the mire. Less than 24 hours later, the World Trade Center was decimated by two hijacked planes. To Michael's followers, their Messiah had just accurately predicted the fall of the Tower of Babel. If any of his remaining followers harbored doubts about their Messiah, 9-11 expelled them. They would have followed him to the ends of the earth. Which, according to Michael's prophecy, was the plan. They redoubled their efforts to prepare for the end of the world, ready and excited to die. And Michael continued to subliminally communicate his messages to his followers through his website. In one post, Michael referred to Bible passages that talked about being naked before the Lord and lying naked beside Him. And soon enough, one of his most devoted teenage followers got the message. 
A young woman named Esther soon showed up at Michael's trailer and told him that, for whatever reason, she felt a need to take off all of her clothes in front of him. Later, she remembered that Michael smiled at her. Then she asked, Shall I? Michael was quiet for a moment, and Esther believed he was listening for God's answer. Finally, he told her it was God's will. Esther stripped naked, then let Michael hold her in bed. She later said that the moment she laid with him, she began to see God. The next day, another teenager on the compound showed up to lay with Michael. It's unclear whether she had talked to Esther about her experience, or if she, too, interpreted Michael's blog in the same way, independent of Esther. A few days after that, Michael made an announcement. He required seven virgins to take as witnesses. Esther was among the six women who immediately volunteered. For many of Michael's volunteers, however, this was the last straw. John and Elsa Sayer, for instance, realized that Michael was a fraud and immediately made plans to leave the compound. Unfortunately, their 14-year-old daughter, Ashley, and 16-year-old daughter, Lakeisha, refused to leave. In fact, both daughters had volunteered themselves as virgin witnesses. Michael even renamed Ashley Healed after she volunteered. Heartbroken, the Sayers felt they had no choice but to leave their daughters on the compound and pursue outside legal action to get them back. Healed, meanwhile, was the next girl to lay beside Michael naked. She would later testify that Michael was also naked during at least one of these encounters and put his hand over her heart when they lay together. Of course, that also meant touching her breast. These encounters were less about sex than they were about control. Dr. Alexandra Stein studied the abuse of women in cults for NBC News. She found that cult leaders take control of women's sex lives as a way to isolate them further and further within the cult. It's another way to suppress individuality and maintain control. These women were now his claimed virgins and had to maintain that status, eschewing any other sexual contact with another person to maintain their status in Michael's eyes. Targeting the youngest women in Strong City was also a way to ensure the up-and-coming generation was brought deeper into the fold. For Heald and the other children on the compound, Strong City was home. They had never known life outside the cult and had been conditioned their entire lives to regard Michael as the Messiah. Given the circumstances, it makes sense that they were unable to see the ways in which they were being manipulated and groomed by a 60-year-old predator. To them, they were beginning to understand God's love in a new, intimate way. Over the next five years, Michael continued to take witnesses and lay with naked, underage followers. But in 2006, he crossed a line that would leave his own son, Jeff, heartbroken. In a later interview, Jeff Bent said that God had done a shocking and astonishing thing. He had told Jeff's wife, Christiana, to be consummate with Michael. She became one of his witnesses. Jeff believed that it was the Lord's way of challenging him and testing his loyalty, and he refused to be broken, at least on the surface. But after Christiana began sleeping with Michael, Jeff grew noticeably thinner and more gaunt. By 2007, he was nearly skin and bones. Yet Christiana felt no guilt. She had long been baptized into sinlessness, and her intuition told her that God wanted this union. Jeff's feelings were irrelevant. A year later, in an interview, Michael was asked whether he consummated with Christiana more than once. He didn't hesitate to say yes. When asked why, he smiled softly and said, Could you not answer that question yourself? When you marry your wife, do you consummate only once? By April 2007, Michael had but a few dozen followers, many of whom were underage children. While most children their age were excited for summer break to start, the youth of Lord Our Righteousness Church were anticipating the apocalypse. That summer, the sheriff arrived on the property with John and Elsa Sayer in tow. They had come for their 16-year-old daughter, Heald, who was forcibly removed from the compound. But within a few months, Heald was back. She had run away from her home to rejoin Michael at Strong City. 
Heald wasn't the only teenager removed from the compound, and she wasn't the only one to find her way back, either. Others ran away, emancipated themselves, and went on hunger strikes until their parents finally let them return to Michael. None of them, it seemed, wanted to miss out on the end of the world, set to arrive at midnight on Halloween. In the final days before the apocalypse, Michael began giving taped interviews to a BBC News reporter who had been closely following the cult over the past six months. Possibly because he felt he had nothing to hide, or possibly because he genuinely thought the world was about to end. Michael was overly transparent about the goings-on at Strong City. He allowed his teenage followers to give interviews about their experiences as witnesses. And for Jeff to discuss his marriage with Christiana. Then, on October 31st, 2007, the world ended at midnight, just as Michael had foretold. At least within the walls of the compound. But beyond Strong City, life continued, and Michael's interviews had piqued the attention of the local authorities, who were shocked to discover that a 66-year-old man was grooming underage women to be his wives. They started to build a case against him. Michael had tried to garner the world's attention to his cult in 1996, and it failed. Eleven years later, he would find that the eyes of the entire nation were bearing down on him. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. We'll be back with part two of Wayne Bent and the Lord Our Righteousness Church next Tuesday. Next week, a cult leader goes on trial, and Michael fights to keep his freedom as his former followers fight for their families. You can find more episodes of Cults, as well as all of ParCast's other shows, on Spotify or your favorite podcast directory. Several of you have asked how to help us. If you enjoy the show, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at ParCast, and Twitter at ParCast Network. We'll see you next time. Cults was created by Max Cutler, is a production of Cutler Media, and is part of the ParCast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Dick Schroeder, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro and Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Freddie Beckley. This episode of Cults is written by Tim Davis and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. Hi, listeners. It's Ashley Flowers, and here's a quick reminder to check out my new true crime limited series, International Infamy. Every Tuesday, I'm taking you across the globe to look at 15 of the most notorious crimes from 15 different countries. Some stories are sure to shock. Some may leave you stumped, but all are quite the trip. Follow my new series, International Infamy with Ashley Flowers. Listen for free on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts.